Okay, the next question here is, what do you think about more vitamin C, more vitamin D, more vitamin fill in the blank? Um, I'm just gonna be really blunt here, guys. There is a lot of stuff going around the internet of take this form of liposomal vitamin C and take this type of this, and if you get sick, use this and use this and use this and make sure you have enough copper and viruses can't go through copper and you also need to make, viruses can't have silver, so make sure you've got, let me just be really clear on this stuff. I don't care how much vitamin C you're rubbing on your testicles or your nipples or whatever, total nonsense. Okay. There's nothing wrong with taking vitamin D. We are certainly recommending that our patients keep up with the normal supplementation of things that matter. And I can't for a second imagine how having optimal levels of vitamin C, vitamin D, you know, all of the usual things that we would think about matter. But to think for one moment that going all out on the do-it-yourself hacker, biohacker, um, you know, protocol is going to somehow offer you immunity is is not just sort of idiotic it's actually dangerous because it is then going to probably put you and or somebody else at risk so um i don't mean to sound like a, like a great uh, you know a grumpy old man but when i see these lists of like just do these 12 things and you'll be fine um you know buyer beware um so you know if you want to sit in the sauna every day, that's great. I think there are enormous benefits to sitting in the sauna. And we could sit here and talk about, you know, BDNF and heat shock proteins and vascular endothelial factors. And I love all that stuff. And it's almost assuredly not hurting you to suggest for a second it's helping you is irresponsible. Um, and if that turns out to be the case in a few years that we've figured that out, I'll be happy to be proven wrong that this was the most important line of defense, but it's not a gamble I'm willing to take. Okay, next question. Why do you think the death rate of infected people vary so much between countries? Um, I think it's a great question, and I think it's the, the, the best example I think to look at right now is, you know, frankly, compare China versus Italy, which are the top two countries. These are the number one and number two countries in terms of lethality. And the differences of case fatality rate, so it's important to remember semantics here, case fatality rate is mortality divided by known cases by definition, the case fatality rate is an overestimate of the aggregate mortality. Why? Because it can't count the number of people who have the disease who aren't getting counted, right? By definition, there are always going to be people who have the disease who are, it's such a mild disease, we don't know it. So if the case fatality rate is 5%, the actual mortality for everybody who gets it is lower. But nevertheless, when you compare the CFR in Italy, which at this point is being reported at somewhere between seven and eight percent, and you compare the case fatality rate in China, which was, you know, in the neighborhood of two to three percent. Um, how do you account for that difference? I, I think there are a couple of things. I think the first is in Italy you do have an older patient population and a higher prevalence of smokers. Um, I was a little surprised to see that. I, I wasn't surprised at the age gap. I would have assumed that the number of smokers in Italy would not have been materially different from, from China, but at least what we're seeing epidemiologically, it suggests that that's the case. I think the second issue is the healthcare system in Italy, uh, based on what we are hearing from people in Italy running ICUs and hospitals, is their system was way closer to capacity when the insult hit, so they just had far less headroom to move than we saw in China. And I think the third issue, though I, I, it's, it might be a bit soon to say this, um, could be the lack of time between a coordinated government response and the outcome. And when you compare the two biggest outbreaks in China, there is a clear difference between them that can be largely attributed to that response. Um, and so, again, when you, when you think about this, and I apologize that I'm sort of turning this back to a U.S.-centric discussion, I think it's just too soon to say, and I, I can't even speculate about what the, the response will be in the United States, other than to say it probably isn't going to be um, homogenous. It will probably look different in different parts of the country, um, but I suspect that those factors could feed into it as well. Next question is, who are the people that are most at risk? And again, I've sort of alluded to this in a previous question, but I think it's worth stating again. People who smoke are at risk. People who have smoked are at risk. 
people who have diabetes, and in here we're talking both type 1 and type 2. I was actually surprised to see the risk in type 1 diabetes. Um, the risk in type 2 diabetes is a little easier to see because it often accompanies some of the other comorbidities like high blood pressure that also feed into the risk profile. Age over 70 is being viewed as a, a really big cutoff because that's about where you see a doubling of the case fatality rate. High blood pressure and heart disease are also risk factors, and there are lots of things that we can speculate on this front. Certainly one of them is people that have more ACE2 receptors, which if you go back to the very first or second question, we talked about how the ACE2 receptor is potentially a portal by which the virus gains access to the cell called the type 2 pneumocyte, where we think it's doing the majority of its damage. Um, last question for now, um, obviously we'll continue to keep people updated, is just what is the status of testing? I sort of alluded to this in a previous um, Q, a, a question a moment ago, but basically as of now, meaning about 20 minutes ago when I last checked, there were no commercial uh, tests available, uh, but there were 75,000 tests that were being given out uh, uh, through the CDC, to my understanding, uh, being distributed uh, just to local um, and state authorities, uh, but I don't have a I don't have a clear sense of how those are being distributed. Now tomorrow, which is Thursday, or maybe the day some of you are going to see this today, um, is really the day that I believe the CDC was initially promising to deliver one million kits. I also believe that yesterday they announced there would be a delay in that. I apologize, I don't know when that um, delivery will take place. It is obviously a very important piece of this equation. The more we can test people in an accurate manner using PCR in a short period of time, the more quickly we can not just triage, but understand how to contain the virus. Anyway, I hope you found these helpful. Um, we will continue to sort of provide updates as, as soon as we become um, able to do so. We will be putting out one or two podcasts, um, probably Saturday, Sunday, Monday, not even sure. Basically, you know, we're stripping off the bells and whistles. If the show notes are good, if the transcripts are good, we don't really care. We're just going to try to get information out as soon as we can. Um, and I appreciate your, your patience as we, uh, you know, struggle to come up with, you know, actionable information here.